So I'm Daphna Joel. I'm a professor of neuroscience in Tel Aviv University in Israel. And in the past 10 years or so, I've been working on the relation between sex, brain and gender. Is there such thing as a male or female brain? No, <laughs> there is no. So although there are sex differences in the brain, brain structure and function, and also we have lots of evidence from animals that sex, sex chromosomes, sex hormones do affect brain structure and function. These effects do not adapt consistently within, within individual brains to create two types of brains. Instead, they mix up in each of our brains. So each one of us has a unique mosaic of features. Some are more common in males, others are more common in females. But these mosaic brains, they do not sort into two types. What would examples be then of the difference of characteristics of like masculine or feminine? I think it's easier to understand if you look at the human behaviors or psychological characteristics because it's the same there. So you can dis discuss or, or describe feminine and masculine characteristics, like for, uh, for example, being empathic is more feminine, being aggressive is more masculine. But when you look at some of these characteristics together in a single individual, it's rarely that someone has only feminine or only masculine characteristics. Most of us has both some feminine characteristics and some masculine, and each is a unique mosaic. So I'm sure you know this about yourself. But how would you go about researching this? Like, how do you isolate empathy in a brain? Right, so in the brain, we don't look for these types of uh, functions because you cannot do this one-to-one -one, uh, one -one mapping. But what we do is look at brain structure using imaging, MRI, for example. And then we can measure volume of specific regions, or we can measure the strengths of connections between different regions. And what we do is we look for the regions or features that show the largest differences between men and women in the specific sample that we look at. And then we look at each individual to see whether these uh, differences add up in the individual brain. So for example, if a specific region is larger on average in women than in men, then being large is a feminine type, if you want, and being small is a masculine type. And then you can look at another region and do the same. But what you see is that each brain has some features in the female typical form and other features in the male typical form. So this is what we do. What happens so if you average out across all individual brains? Is there anything that points between male or female or you can't characterize them in any way? Now this, that's a reverse prediction. So if, you, if I know everything about you, let's, let's put the brain aside for a minute because it's easier with behaviors, but it's the same principle. So if I know what you like to do and what's your preferences and attitude, etc., I can predict with high probability whether you are male or female. But usually this is not the type of prediction I want to make because I just look at you and I know that you're female. I don't need you know, to give you 10 questionnaires or to scan your brain to know whether you are male or female. Usually I know that you are male or female and I want to predict your brain mosaic or your personality mosaic. So I want to predict if you are, you know, would be interesting for me to talk to you or not. And I cannot do this on the basis of your sex because the only way, only thing I know is that probably because you are female, you would have more feminine characteristics than masculine characteristics. But I wouldn't know how many of each and more important, I wouldn't know what are your feminine characteristics and what are your masculine characteristics? So if we think, for example, a, on two men, one is highly aggressive and likes to watch porn and the other one is great in navigation and uh, is very good in spatial uh, rotation, then I know which men I want to date, right? So both of them have two masculine characteristics, but the question is not how many, but which one they have. And what about the role that culture plays in this. Could that be so strong that it comes to shape having a male or female brain? Right. So you're moving now to another question, which is, uh, which is the question of nature versus nurture. So we see differences in brain, in behavior, and you ask, where do these differences come from? And this is a completely different question. So just before I answer this, what we do is we look at the differences. We don't know their source. We don't care about their source. We only ask, do they add up consistently? Maybe the nature put them there, maybe nurture put them there. We don't care. What we see is that they never add up consistently. Now, the question of nature or nurture, you cannot really answer in humans because there is no way to cancel out culture. So unless we live in a gender-free world, which we don't, 
We have no idea whether sex contributes to the differences we see between men and women. But I personally think it's not really important because even today, when we have both sex affecting us and gender as a cultural system affecting us, even now we don't sort out, uh, sort up nicely into the men type and the women type. So it doesn't really matter. I guess that when gender does, not, does no longer exist, we'll just be more variable than we already are. So what does this change then? What are the ramifications of being able to see individuals as having mosaic brains? I think we should, as a, as a, a culture or a society, we should strive that we can all be able to see humans as the mosaic they are, instead of forcing us into these two categories, the male category and the female category. I think these categories are highly restrictive to all, both men and women. Uh, I think we all suffer from this binary view of gender and of sex. And I hope we can get rid of this system and just treat people as humans. And do you, are you optimistic about that, that we'll ever be able to just see people as humans and not as within sexes? It's, I am always optimistic, but uh, I think we could because, uh, for example, our attitude to color, the skin color has changed. It still needs, you know, there's way to go, but it has changed. I think if you ask people 200 years ago, if uh, they would see white uh, people and black people as similar, equal, etc., they would be horrified by this idea. And now we will be ho horrified by, you know, having separate toilets for black and white people. So I hope we'll, we'll get there also with sex. So our, the form of our genitalia would be just one other features, physiological feature, like, like the color of our eyes or whether we use our right or left hand, and it will carry no further social meaning. And would you see such research or the findings of your research as being feminist? Would you describe yourself as a feminist neuroscientist? I'm a neuroscientist and a feminist. Does this affect my science? Yes, because our opinions uh, affect our science, but especially it makes me more uh, aware of my preconceptions. And I think the problem with many scientists uh, is that they are not aware of their preconceptions. And one important preconception is that of the binary view of sex. And this is a cultural thing, and it uh, strongly affects our ability to think out of, outside of this binary. And in this way, it restricts our ability to do good science when it comes to sex and the brain or sex in general. So I think being a feminist and a neuroscientist helps me do better science and less biased science because I'm more aware of the structural and conceptualizations that structure my work or structure my thinking. So is this proof then that gender is non-binary? Gender as a system, as a cultural system, is binary. But if, we, if you think of gender of something that you have, then although most people do have male or female genitalia, they don't have male or female nature. So they don't have a man or a woman gender. Rather, most of us have a mosaic of different gender characteristics. So in this sense, gender does not exist at the individual level, but it truly does at the social level, and it has a strong impact on each of us. And so what areas of research does this then impact on that maybe now can be explored further? Or either that you'd like to do or you'd like to see it be done by other people? So getting rid of the binary view of uh, sex and gender is important even for medicine, for example. So uh, we need to study both males and females, but we need to be aware of not thinking that there is male physiology and female physiology, because most of the features that affect our, our, our human health and human disease uh, are not strictly or distinctly um, spread or divided into two sets. So for example, the sex hormones, both males and females have them. Uh, they are dynamic, they are changing. There are other features that are related to sex that don't split up nicely into two types. So the, the challenge is how we start studying sex and sex effects on the body, on the human body, uh, beyond this binary division. And this is a big challenge in science, and I'm trying to promote this. And does this mean that we should look towards focusing on the individual? Yes, but so just to give you an example, in cardiovascular diseases, there are differences sometimes between when, men and women, and there are thought to be sex differences. But it turns out that some of these, at least some of these differences relate 
or are relevant to height. So there are actually height differences. Taller people have different um, flexibility of the arteries compared to shorter people. And because height is a big difference between men and women, it was erroneously thought as a sex difference. But if you are a tall woman, then you should get a different treatment than a short man or for a short a woman. So this is an example how the binary of sex really interferes with us finding the mechanisms of health and disease and developing new treatments. One final question. We're at our Arts and Ideas Festival. Are there any other scientists whose work has really inspired you that you would like to recommend that other people read or find out about? Yes, so Anne Faust of Sterling has brought several great books about uh, sex and brain and gender and this binary conventions. And Cordelia Fine also had wrote, written several great books. The latest one is Testosterone Rex, and I really recommend every person to to read this. And I personally written now just uh, going to publish a book about all my ideas about sex, brain and gender and I hope it can make a change. And if you had to sort of uh, dilute that into a few sentences, how would you put that across your findings from like the mosaic brain? That most humans can be divided into two according to the form of their genitalia, but this division doesn't go beyond the genitalia. Beyond the genitalia, each human is a unique mosaic of features. Some are more common in females, others are more common in males. But whatever you like and do, if it's appropriate to humans, it's appropriate to you. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.